of this Sudaikyo IndyCar Grand Prix. It's Michael Andretti, Alonzo Jr., Philip Pali, Mario Andretti, Bobby Rahal and Eddie Cheever. That's how they stand. And uh, it's very ominous here that Emerson Fittipaldi is really starting to make a move back in third place. There's, in fact, a sort of equal gap now between Michael Andretti, Alonso Jr. and Emerson Fittipaldi. Emerson, in fact, was closer there just as we went to commercial, but he got held up by one of the slower cars, and he's now trying to get that gap down that little bit by little bit without forcing the car and it's a question of trying to be ensuring yourself that you're not taking too much out of the car yeah well he did a 39.6 before which was an extremely quick lap and uh, he did drop back with the traffic and as you say Jackie it almost sees dropping back again uh, I'd like to think he's sort of somehow controlling it to be honest yeah, I think he is. I, I think he's... There's no reason to go shooting into going fast speeds unnecessarily because it's too early in the rat race to do that and the walls and all of the elements of risk here are just a little bit too high. I think he's too intelligent to let it go. Incidentally, we've been told that Rick Mears is dropping back a little bit because he's damaged his front wings and we've still, incidentally, got a service vehicle on the track. The flag is out at the start-finishing line advising the drivers with a white flag and a red cross in it to say that there is a service vehicle out there. Alonzo Jr. chasing Michael Andretti, Emerson Fittipaldi back in third place. That's how they stand there, one, two and three. These two have been hard at it since the green flag dropped. And Michael Andretti made just the perfect start, just accelerated the car away, got the, everything working properly, the power to the ground and just won that race of the first chicane. But the gap hasn't really changed much between one and two, but it certainly has changed between second and third, with uh, Emerson Fittipaldi coming back into third place with a hard charge. Michael Andretti out in front, as was expected. He was the fastest man for two days around this circuit. Then out of the blue, in practice, this man, Alonzo Jr., came through and nailed the pole position by just uh, tenths of a second. So it's been a great duel between the two young lions as you ride now with Michael Andretti through the back streets of Surface Paradise. That's the first chicane through there and really is quite a tricky one. It's the next one here, though, that uh, we've had some problems with. As they, no, we've passed that. That was the second one. Came through very well there and we're now into the back streets around the high-rise building. So lots of twists and turns here, lots of chances for the car to get sideways and then brush the wall here a number of times, particularly Eddie Cheever whilst he was practicing, but Andretti under full control here. Swings around and will be back onto the Gold Coast Highway and the main front straight. Darrell, we've just had a note handed us to up here at the commentary box to say that the service vehicle has been sent out to collect Rick Mears wing parts. And I find that extraordinary. I mean, that's what you've got marshals for. Surely it's a lot simpler to jump over the fence or, or for a marshal to get those parts and heave them back rather than to send a vehicle out on the circuit. I think here in Surface Paradise, unlike um, Adelaide, for example, and other Grand Prix circuits, there doesn't seem to be as many gaps in the fences for marshals to be able to do that. It seems futile for me, however, to see a vehicle having to drive round in heavy race traffic. That's a very big hazard. To have that just to pick up a broken piece on the, on the, on the racetrack doesn't seem to be common sense. Well, comments from men who know there's uh, four world championships in Formula One sitting beside me here in the commentary box. With the track clear now, we have a, a flag indicating we have a clear track, so the pace is back on. It's still Michael Andretti out in front, Al Unzer Jr. come through, and then Emerson Fittipaldi. That's the space from one, two, and three, so it's an even battle at the moment, a battle of tactics, and perhaps, as Jackie and Alan have suggested, Emerson Fittipaldi is controlling those tactics. I think, in fact, uh, they're all pacing themselves quite well. This is Eddie Cheever that we're looking over the shoulder of right now. Eddie, of course, uh, born in Phoenix, Arizona, presently in sixth position, brought up most of his life in Italy. His father runs health spas and gymnasiums, so he's been a fit boy all his life, is a vegetarian. Of course, has driven a lot of Grand Prix cars in his day. Never had an enormous amount of success, obviously looking for it here in the Indy Series. One of the highest paid IndyCar drivers right now. He came over from Formula One just at the sort of halcyon period of the driver fee business and gained enormously by it on a multi-year contract. And he, of course, is getting the new Ford engine, which is a big advantage to Chip Canassi's team, uh, who he drives for. 
finished 15th in last year's Indy race here, was involved in a race crash, of course, with Little Al and Mario Andretti, and that was on the top part of the circuit going through that chicane, and it was a pretty nasty incident with just a handful of laps to go around this area, in fact, is where it happened, and uh, it really did sort of cruel any chances Eddie had had, but he's been pretty rough and ragged right through uh, training and practice for, for qualifying, but he seems to be a lot smoother now. The car seems to be handling a lot better for Eddie Cheever. Back in six spot and doing a pretty handy job. Remember, if there's a yellow flag situation, these gaps will close dramatically. But out front, the battle still. Michael Andretti from Alonso Jr. there in the Calmar. That's a brand new car which he has helped finance. And in third place, the beautiful Penske car driven by Emerson Fittipaldi. Alonso, who just flashed through our picture there, was telling me that one of his problems this year has been that they haven't done enough testing. And I said, well, why is that, Al? And he put his two fingers, finger and thumb together just to say that they didn't have the money in the team to do the type of testing that uh, he would like to be doing. So if the team, even at the beginning of the season, is under finance from testing, it's not a very good uh, omen for the future. Michael Andretti, Alonso Jr., hounding the streets of the Gold Coast. And they have been fantastic up here right throughout the week with the amount of promotion they've done. And there's a lot of people all around the world now with their eyes glued to the Gold Coast of Queensland. Of course, motor racing, as international as it is, has the Sebring 12-hour race this weekend. It also has the Mexican Grand Prix, which, of course, will be covered here on Channel 9. On pole position so far, for those of you who are interested, is Patrese in pole position. Second fastest is the other Williams car of Nigel Mansell. And a Schumacher is right up there, as also is Berger. And uh, Brundle's been doing very well in the other Ford engine car. That's encouraging for him. It, it certainly is, and it's also good news to uh, hear that uh, Ayrton Senna is reasonably well up after that accident of his. It's interesting also to know that these guys are all lapping in the 39, so the pace is really picking up, and the fuel load's coming down a little bit, but they're actually lapping at quite a hot pace. And you can see them coming up on the Filipino driver now as they come to him, Marcelo, Joby Marcelo, his first year in IndyCar racing in that very distinctive gold car. There he is there in front of Emerson Fittipaldi. He'll want to get him out of the way as quickly as possible. There he goes now, and Marcelo did the right thing. He pulled over and let Emerson Fittipaldi go. And the gap now probably changed a little bit because of the traffic as Marcelo now tails them up. And if anybody lost any ground, it was probably, I think, little Al. Alonso Jr. dropping a little bit off the pace to Michael Andretti. But he seems to close it up in the, the latter part of the circuit. He loses down to horsepower here. And this is uh, Rick Mears. Rick Mears. So he's had his wings fixed. It's still, you can see the no, damage the wing, there. No, the wing end plate yeah. is off the... Yeah, it's the, off the as car. you're looking at your screen yeah. on the right-hand side of the car, there's no end plate on his front wing. You can see the end plate on the left-hand side. That is an air management uh, part of the, the wing area, and, in fact, it can be quite expensive. Well, Rick Miss finished third last year, was fourth in the 91 season's point score standings, and driving a car that is slightly damaged. Jackie Dallin, how much does that upset the handling of the motor car? A lot. It, he's definitely be getting understeer. Look at the wing is flapping up there, that part of the wing. There's another bit blown off. Now, that won't be helping him at all because that's one of the rear flaps of the front wing, and that downforce at the one side will absolutely be wrong, and the whole front end of the car will not be getting glued to the track the way that Rick Mears would like it. Of course, it'll, it'll be okay a little bit better on left-handers than it is in right-handers, and there's more of those in this racetrack than there are the others. Well, Jackie Stewart, Barry Sheen has been listening to what you've been saying with interest. He's over in the pit lane and maybe can solve the problem whether Rick Mears will come in. Well, they're undecided at the moment. I've just been talking to Roger Penske, the boss, who's behind me, and uh, he said, yes, we're losing time, but we're just deciding what to do at the moment. So with Rick on the old radio, and uh, I guess at the end of the day, it's uh, toss-up who it's down to whether he comes in, but as it stands at the moment, I don't think they are going to bring him in. Well, it'll be a question, Barry, I think, that if there are yellow comes on or they come in for any other reason, for a fuel stop, etc., they'll leave it until that happens in the hope that there hasn't been a yellow so far. So logically, the law of averages would say there's going to be a yellow and they would all take advantage of coming in at that time and clearly not losing as much ground on the track. Plus, also, we know that they have a compulsory pit stop anyway, so it really is a matter of how much time he's losing in what amount of laps that he's doing. 
and I, whoops, a uh, bit untidy there for Mole Michael going through the chicane. I would guess that Roger Penske, being the sort of guy that he is, will have it all worked out down to the last calculation. I think also, however, there will be uh, probably a lot of common sense being used up by the driver here. So I think uh, we'll see uh, Rick Mears, as a man of enormous experience, knowing what to do and when to come in. Incidentally, we're also recognizing from our lap chart and our timers here in the booth with us that Fittipaldi is dropping back. He's now four point, well, four seconds really behind uh, little Al. So maybe the traffic caused that. Maybe he's chosen to go back a little bit. Who knows? But he certainly opened up a, a four second gap, which is not all good. So Philip Pauli losing some ground. Michael Andretti has led from the drop of the flag. He's gained a little territory here on little Al Unza Jr. Car 30 there, as you see, going through is uh, Babaza, and he's been having a pretty ordinary practice session. So he'll get out of the way of this leading bunch as quickly as possible and let them go through. I think Andretti's almost uh, breaking, broken the back of this right now. I think this is now difficult for Little Al to react, unless there's a yellow or unless, and of course there will be before the end of this race. I mean, the politics in this type of racing with the yellow flag business, there may well be. But I think uh, Andretti's really got the grip on the pace of this race now. We'll take a break. Be back shortly to answer those questions. After 18 laps of this in gruel a grueling race, we've got uh, Michael Andretti, Al Hunter Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi, Mario Andretti, Eddie Cheever, Bobby Rahal. You're looking at Eddie Cheever there in shot. And we've just noticed whilst we were in break that Fittipaldi is spinning tyres in the slow corners, Jackie. I mean, how does that have a bearing on, uh, on his position at the moment? He's been losing some ground visibly to uh, Al Hunter Jr., but the tyres are spinning in the slower turns. Well, that means he's getting the power on a little too early, maybe anticipating a little bit, and maybe he's overheated his tyres, Darrell. If he's been driving hard to keep up, he may well have done that. I think Bobby Rahal, was Bobby Rahal passed there by, uh, by Scott Pruitt? It looked like Scott Pruitt. I don't know who it was, but uh, it looked that he had made a pass there uh, while we were in conversation. There is Eddie Cheever, of course. Flicking it through there, using a lot of curve, getting that car flying. The big risk, of course, is that you can damage front wings very easily on that. And we notice now several pits are preparing for some stops. I see the AJ Foyt pit is preparing to get Gregor Wojtek to come in, so we may be able to see some action in the pit lane. And Barry Sheen is down in the pits. Barry, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Jackie, and uh, over my shoulder, I don't know whether you can see it, but this is uh, the new wing to go on uh, Rick Mears' car. They're not going to bring him in especially to do it, but they're going to change the, change the nose when they change the tyres and refuel it. So... Uh, it's a fair old lump, and this is what was broken off of it. You know, the top little, uh, what do you call them, side dam things. Uh, so without that, he's, as you were saying, it mucks up all his uh, aerodynamics on the front. So he won't be a very pleased person. Well Back done, Bazo. We're looking at Eddie Cheever now. And uh, Eddie Cheever has uh, really had his problems here throughout the weekend, but everything's come right for him at the right time. The car looks a lot better balanced, Jackie, doesn't it? It doesn't seem to be moving around on the track near as much as it was in those first practice and qualifying sessions. Mo Nunn is, a, is his engineer, who's one of the most experienced and well-respected engineers, and I, I have great confidence in him. He knows how to put a car together, as we see the service vehicle pulling away a car that's obviously had an engine problem. But Eddie Cheever is a very forceful driver. If I had any criticism about Eddie, it would be that he has great difficulty uh, controlling his emotions. He really does get upset from time to time, and I'm sure it affects his driving. We've also had word from our lap chart here up in the commentary position that Bobby Rahal has lost two places in the last lap, so he's clearly got a problem. I also see that the service vehicle flag is out yet again, and uh, as we were saying before, I think the service vehicle drivers had more laps than AJ Foyt so far. He's certainly out there a lot. I hope he's keeping his tyres cool. So still following Eddie Cheever around. That car we saw with the uh, engine that was in a lot of trouble and smoking was Eric Barchelet. So he's obviously finished his work for the afternoon. Out parked beside the wall on the approach up to the uh, beachfront there on the surface Paradise beachfront. But Eddie Cheever just getting along there. He's in a handy position if there is a yellow flag. And remember last year, there were three or four stoppages. So this time round, the drivers obviously have come to grips with this road circuit a lot better. They've learnt from last year. 
they've understood the braking problems they had last year. They've rectified that. The cars, of course, are different. We've got different car, driver, and engine combinations. Oh, and there's a hit wall. And that's that's, uh, that's AJ Foyt. That's Boytek has gone in, smacked the wall. And also done the tyre wall, too. He's got flat spots in his tyres. It looks like he's a right rear tyre flat. It looked like the right rear tyre of that car was deflated, if we see it again. But he certainly decided that he wasn't going to be able to negotiate the corner and just went straight on as Michael Andretti goes along. We'll see a replay of this. Here he comes into the corner coming along here fairly comfortably he looked like he smacked that uh, yes the tires deflated that's what it is the rear tire whether he hit the wall and it deflated or whether it was deflated before that he certainly uh, caused a little extra damage so aj cars aj Foyt's car is out of the race now and a pit stop a pit stop this is unza coming in al unza jr is it yes coming into the pits doesn't, doesn't, want a, doesn't want any soft drinks, feeling fine. Fittipaldi is also in, so lots of activity now. Two of the top three in getting new rubber. Alonzo Jr. is out. That's a good stop from him, and the crew liked it too. They waved their hands. Here's Emerson Fittipaldi. He'll come out of the pits. Oh, he ran over the hose. Penalty for him. He ran over the air. Uh, the air tool for the tyres. Now, I think you'll find that there is a penalty in kart IndyCar racing for that. That could cost Emerson Fittipaldi the race. Now, I'm not quite sure. I think you'll find it's a stop-and-go penalty. It means that he's going to have to come in as Scott Pruitt is now in the pits. He's getting his pit change in car number 10. Now, that's not something you expect to see from the Penske pit, that problem of Fittipaldi's, Alan, and I think there'll be a little bit of uh, a word mentioned in that area. I think suffice to say he'll get a small tap on the wrist over that because that was definitely the responsibility of the man in charge of the front left-hand wheel. He should have made sure that that uh, air thing was out of the way. Or the man, or the man who uh, who didn't uh, get, who let him go too early. Barry, Barry's down in the pits. Go back to Barry on that. Yeah, Jackie, you're co completely right. I just spoke to one of the guys who really looks unhappy, and uh, he did run over the hose as you saw, and it is definitely a stop-go penalty. And they're standing up on the wall here now, waiting for him. So the drama begins now as we see Michael Andretti coming into the pits. The leader now coming in for his stop. Let's watch this closely. We saw Al Unter Jr. get a really good stop. He was away in quick time. Emerson Fittipaldi had his problems by running out of that air jack, but this stage, everything looks smooth. You saw one of the engineers there trying to clear the, uh, the radiator just in case there was any debris or pieces of paper in there. That's a very good little touch to be sure that that's clear. In the meantime, this will be the man that is going to be leading the race if he gets past the pits early enough. Michael Andretti, of course, has left the pits. So on the 23rd lap, Al Unzer Jr., who dived into the pits, had a really good start. Now, Fittipaldi's coming ah. and had his stop stuck. But did he stop? He's been stopped. Did he stop? Because no. a race official went out there and stopped him again. That may be a problem. They, it was really... <laughs> it looked to me like he was trying to be a little bit pregnant. He didn't come to a complete stop. I don't know, Jackie, it seemed to me like if he got off the cam a bit and lost it and, and couldn't, couldn't get the revs up to get it back on the cam to get going. Barry Shane. Yeah, you're completely right, AJ. As he... He definitely stopped, and then as he dumped the clutch, he went Whoa, and sort of stalled, and it was touch and go as to whether it was going to catch again, but that was why he sort of slowed right down, so he picked it, AJ. So high drama here now on the Gold Coast streets. Michael Andretti now chasing Alonzo Jr. They've all been in for pits at the moment. Emerson Fittipelli having a dreadful mistake. We ran over the air jack, came out again, had to do a stop start and almost lost the car. And Eddie Cheever's in the pits and he's overshot his pit and is now being pushed back by the Canassi crew. This has been a very expensive one. I suggest he's probably stalled his engine as well. There's something wrong with the car. There's certainly something wrong with it. He he's can't in start it. He can't start the car. And he, he's got gear selection troubles as well because they were trying to pl play with the gear shift and try and get it moving. It could be that the starter's jammed. I'm not quite sure. We're looking from our commentary position. He's almost exactly opposite. There is a technical problem in that car. That's not just uh, a question of a stalled engine. They have the front. They have the front of the car off, which suggests they might have a clutch problem because uh, they've got the front two uh, exit hatches on the nose cone off and they're reaching down there and it would appear that he may have a clutch problem. So now we see the positions uh, 
much the same as we were before they all dived into the pits with Andretti there and Al Unser Jr. behind him. So that die still continues in close company. And now it's a question of who gets through the traffic easiest and the lead car generally gets through the traffic easier. Barbatsa there is the red car number 30 that they're, they're going to have to pass him. The blue flag should be waved to Barbatsa to make sure that he knows what's happening. And there we have again a service vehicle out of the track. It does an incredible mileage, this service vehicle. Well, Babasa didn't really do him any favours because he pulled out to get round the other car, which is 42, and that's Barroso. And now we see that Andretti and Alonso Jr. had to sandwich their way through that chicane. I haven't seen the great evidence of, uh, of flagging here, and Barbasa's moved over now. I haven't seen a lot of blue flags been showing. I think... Uh, there's another question of uh, another service vehicle out there, but I, I just think there's... I don't think the flagging is quite up to standard because I did not see too much of that. So this battle... Oh, and there's uh, Brayton, Scott Brayton. Brayton has been towed back with that service vehicle, so that's the reason we saw that flag out, that uh, Brayton has been towed back. Well, he's had a miserable time. He, he really got his act together in the latter part of qualifying and bumped himself up into that uh, a good position in the top ten there, but now it's all gone down the drain. Well, I'm not at all enthusiastic about a car being towed back to the pits. I think it's a terrible hazard that you don't need. I think they should be removed from the racetrack at the earliest opportunity, and there should be gaps in the barriers to allow those cars to be taken off, just to allow a vehicle to be pulling another vehicle around there with a speed differential of probably more than 200 kilometres just doesn't make safety sense. Oh, another car on two, and that's uh, Danny, Danny Sullivan. Sullivan. Danny Sullivan having a spin there at the bottom of that street going up onto the beachfront and lucky to get away that caught it nicely and kept the engine running and there's something i think paper or something in the front wing of alonso jr's car there you can see the distortion just in front of the white nose on the second car there's something stuck there you can see that it looks like a paper now you see the yellow flag being shown there there's not allowed it's to like pass a under the it's yellow. a hat He's picked up somebody's hat that's well, that across must, the track. That chap must have got a hell of a fright if he was on the track. Or if he was under the hat. Well, he's now wearing a hat on the front of the car, and uh, you can clearly see it there as it's bent around. Of course, the, the major problem here is if that hat manages to go over that wing and into the air duct, that could give him severe overheating problems and could very well force him into an unscheduled pit stop. So Michael Andretti with little Al Unzer Jr. sitting in behind him. He's got the hat on the wing. We'll have to watch that because this could have a bearing on this game. And it's a high-speed game being played here on the Gold Coast. And Andretti has controlled it for much of the day. Well, I think little Al's hassling Andretti harder than he has earlier. But that hat actually, oddly enough, will not be helping the aerodynamics of that car, particularly in the faster corners. Uh, you'd be surprised. The wind tunnel factor shows. Now we're getting a yellow flag. We're getting double yellows out. That means the pace car is going to probably come out. Here's and here's the, the hat, why... the famous hat. There it goes. It gets disturbed by the car of Michael Andretti and get tossed on, of course, to the car of, of uh, Little Al. And there we have the pace car coming out. So, new game. Some great uh, camera work there from the nine crew as the cars now dive into the pit area. Just getting that hat picked up so you'll get rid of that because the crews, of course, are watching this telecast on television. Al Unzer Jr. is pointing. He's saying get rid of it. So they would know it's there. OK, well, Rick Mears has been in for a pit stop, but apparently they didn't fix the wing, so this may just give him the opportunity. Now we've had another... And then we've had another hat picked up. So now we've got the two leaders both with hats. Well, that's Matching good. hats. Well, well, it's very nice that they're sharing the responsibility of hat-wearing in this fashion. This is incredible. You'd never see that anywhere. I mean, the two leaders are wearing hats on the front of their car. Al Unser is upset about something. He's trying to wave to attract attention. Uh, he's not just got his head, his hand up in the air there. He was actually waving to attract attention. And there you see that hat being picked up. That is fair play, isn't it? Two hats and the one. It must be a fire sale of hats here in Surfers Paradise. So Michael Andretti now carrying a hat on his wing. Al Unser Jr. wearing the same, uh, same colour. 
It'd be interesting to see if uh, Rick Mears takes advantage of this yellow now to come in and fix that rear wing. He didn't do it during the pit stop, and I'm not quite sure why. It'd be interesting to see if he takes advantage now. I don't know, but I just wonder. It's, a, it's a, the, the, an oversight on the hats. Their, their sponsor identification is not pointing in the correct place. Now, the reason for the yellow was car number 42, who ran into Voitech's stationary car. Now, of course, Voitech's car was down the escape road, so that'll be interesting. OK, as we wait for the field to bunch up under double yellows, we'll take a break, be back shortly. Six laps, it's Michael Andretti, Al Unzer Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi, Danny Sullivan, Mario Andretti and Bobby Rahal. They're the top runners for you here as we're still under double yellow flags on the streets of the Gold Coast in this, the Daikyo IndyCar Grand Prix here in Surface Paradise. You're looking back on Michael Andretti. And we're not too sure whether that hat that was on the wing has gone back into the duct. We'll check it out when we can get a good shot of the car. The other hat is still sitting on the wing of Al Unzer Jr.'s car. There it is there. But the one on uh, Michael Andretti's car seemed to disappear, and we'll try and see if we can see it. I think it looks and it's fairly clear. I think we would see that white hat in the air duct because we had a good opportunity while he was weaving to get his tire temperatures back up. No, I can't see any white in that air duct there. It's fairly clean, I think. So good news there because of that would have uh, caused bad overheating problems with the car. Michael Andretti, who is out in front behind the pace car at the moment, finished 14th in last year's Grand Prix and was, of course, and is the IndyCar champ for this year. Charles Stewart in the pits. Thank you, Darrell. Just the latest report from uh, Eddie Cheever's pit. They do have a clutch engagement problem with the car, but it only seems to be occurring when they come into the pits. Nevertheless, they are concerned about it, especially the owner, Chip Ganassi. They don't really know what's going to happen. Thank you, Chuck. Well, uh, problems continue for Eddie Cheever. He certainly had his share over the last three days and seemed to have sorted the car out. They had to virtually rebuild it after Friday's uh, practice and qualifying session, but he went into the wall pretty hard. So they've worked very hard, his crew, the entire week they've been here on the Gold Coast. The fact that there's no clutch in his car is no great problem for him while he's on the racetrack. A lot of drivers don't even use the clutch nowadays. Uh, it's a new Vogue thing. But uh, the fact that when he comes into the pits, he categorically needs it to start off again. So that's a, a big deal for him. I think uh, the other thing regarding this hat problem, the risk, of course, lies with Alan Jr. If that hat does come dislodged and it goes into the radiator, that is a problem for him. So cars coming in and out of the pits now. That's car 21, which is Buddy Lazier. He has been in and out of the pits a number of times today. So, Barry Sheen, you're over there. What's news? Well, I thought I'd give you a hat update. So, uh, the, uh, the hat on Al's car, as you can see, is still there. Uh, it's disappeared on Michael's, and I just spoke to the Cosworth guy, and he says he doesn't think it's gone in the radio, so because on the telemetry thing, the, the temperature hasn't risen. So, uh, hopefully, it's just disappeared off, and someone's got himself a new hat. Thanks, Barry. Back to you, Dazzle. And you can see Wojtek's car, they're coming back in. Uh, he obviously had a a left rear that had gone flat under brakes and had to steer it off the circuit down one of the escape tracks and bang the tires pretty hard so that's been cleared from the circuit now buddy lazare sitting in his pit we're still still under double yellows we'll take a break and come back laps at sandretti alonzo jr Fittipaldi Sullivan, Mario Andretti, Bobby Rahal, they have been indicated by the starter that they're on this lap now. He had his finger up, there's a service vehicle still out, the double yellows have come down, but to explain what a full course yellow flag means, let's hear from the starter himself, Nick Fanoro. That indicates that the course is full course yellow. For an example, if you're, you're leading the race and there's a fellow in back you, no one can pass one another. You have to remain in your position you were run when they get two yellow flags come out. That's after you remain that way until everything is cleared off. When everything is cleared off, as I said before, the control will say one, one lap next time by and I'll indicate with my finger to the whole line of cars, of cars. And then what happens, then when they come around again, then we'll go green. 
OK, well, of course, the yellow flag will probably be a bit of a benefit to some people, Jackie, because there's a couple of people out there that thought they might have been right on the limit as regarding fuel. So these slow laps will indeed help them in that area. And with brakes, Alan. It will allow brakes to cool down, and if there's brake wear that's high, and it was suggested by one or two of the drivers, that could also be a little helping hand. So these yellows, from the point of view of a driver, as you say, running tight on fuel, or on the other hand, running tight on brakes, certainly make life a lot easier. Well, I'm looking at the starter in front of me. The service vehicle flag has now been withdrawn, and they're delving around looking for another flag. I expect it to be a green flag. And he has a green flag in his hand, so we can expect to be under race conditions very shortly as the cars make their way back around the circuit here. What's it like from a driver's point of view, Jackie, to come in and out of a race situation? You're on full pace, you've got the full concentration, all of a sudden you're back maybe doing five, six, seven laps like this. Well, I did uh, a couple of indie races, and it's uh, just a question of pacing yourself, knowing what to do. Now, there they're on it now. The, the leading guys are really stepping on it now because they know they're going to get the green in any case. There's full acceleration right now, and there they get the green flag. There they have it. But, I mean, quite frankly, they anticipated it a long time beforehand. So racing again now, 30 out of 65 as they blast their way down through the two chicanes. And you can see now they've all bunched up again. It's still Michael Andretti from Alonzo Jr. Oh, very close stuff in there on that chicane as Andretti comes through the next chicane. Then Alonzo Jr. tucked in behind him. And then Emerson Fittipaldi is there as well. So one, two and three as they've been running prior to the pit stops and all of the problems we had before. But interesting now that the field is bunched. So perhaps now, if somebody was having some break problems they've cooled those down and they can keep in touch with the leading bunch but at the moment Andretti seems to be controlling things very well from the front he certainly does Daryl yeah I mean he got the jump there he's definitely got a horsepower advantage and can pretty well control the situation as he likes Jackie I think he is I think that's how uh, he can do it fairly easily it would seem the hat of the year man, however, is, is probably going to have to struggle a little bit because Fittipaldi's now come up and giving him a little bit of push and a shove. Cheever there, you can see, is some distance back. Emerson Fittipaldi, though very wise, you know, he knows there's going to be another yellow during this race. It would be very unlikely that with another 30 or 35 laps there isn't going to be another yellow. So why cook the business? That's why the pacing in this kind of race and keeping that double yellow flag factor is, is the unknown quantity for always. Are you surprised a little that Bobby Rahal hasn't made a charge into the top four at this stage of the race? I think he's got a problem. I think it's very simple. He, he's got to be satisfied with what he's got. He's in sixth place right now. And uh, he's either got a problem or he's really keeping himself calm and holding himself back. But I think he's just a little bit too far back for that. So Michael Andretti, Alonzo Jr. now coming back to the chicane area. This is on the Gold Coast Highway part of the circuit. The second chicane, they're negotiating through now. A little bit of curve hitting there. Low angle camera, you see the speed of the cars. Then they'll go hard on the brakes down here and then whip around up onto that very fast straight section again, which leads them up to the surface paradise beachfront. You know, much has been said in past years about the competitiveness of Indy kart racing versus Formula One. And I think what's beginning to happen as kart racing gets more and more sophisticated with this better engine program and one or two other things, you're going to see the leading teams with the biggest money being able to dominate, and that's what you're seeing right now. Most of the big money teams are just taking the big advantage, and I think the close racing that we've known in the past in kart Indy car racing may not be reflected in the future, unless this yellow flag business comes into play. And of course, that yellow flag, and by the way, there Andretti locked up a wheel coming into that chicane, so he's pushing it on a little bit. He, he, he had done that in practice, and that was one of the reasons twice that he went straight over that very same ch chicane. So I think he may just have a little bit too much braking emphasis towards his front wheels, just a fraction. Yeah, I think that's the... In fact, when I saw that, I thought, oops, here we go again. But uh, obviously, I'd rather have that here than here we go as a replay of it. Now, he's coming in, he lifts that le left wheel, gets it a little light, under the brakes, locks it up, gets off the brakes, gets his steering and everything back. But it looks like it could have been a rear, actually. Well, I tell you what, again, with Channel 9's cameraman down there, you could almost see the discoloration of the tyre as it went round after it had stopped. Well, that certainly doesn't help the, uh, you know, if he flat spots it a bit, that'll give him a severe vibe. Oh, he's chopping it. 
just gone over the curves then. I don't know. He certainly, I mean, you wouldn't expect Michael to be getting tired at this stage and losing concentration, but he is getting a little bit ragged. And a service vehicle on the circuit. Once again, we have a flag in front of us, the white flag with the red cross on it. That's indicating to the drivers a service vehicle is out there. We'll pick up any incidents if we can. I think the reason for that, going over that curve, was he was put off slightly by the brake lock. And as you and I both know, occasionally we can use our timing after we've had a little fright it's difficult for us to get back in absolutely to the groove immediately and it takes two or three corners to get the rhythm back and i think that's what happened to to michael andretti there you can see those large rear brake ducts sticking up just either side of the rear wing as the camera looks directly at the front of the car and that's really forcing that cold air into those rear brakes and making sure that they don't have the brake problems that they had last year but look at the advantage he's now taken on Alan Jr. He's just ripped away from him in these last two laps. After he, and there's a double yellow. We've got a double yellow again. Scott Goodyear has broken down and the tow car is out. That's car 15. That's the reason for the double yellow flags as we take that beautiful shot down looking on the, the two cars from the top of the high-rise buildings here on the Gold Coast. You can see that the cars have slowed right down. And uh, there's the flag marshal doing exactly what he's supposed to do. He's pointing and waving the flag, explaining to uh, where the problem is. Scott Yurt Goodyear in car 15 will be towed from the circuit, and that's the reason we have double yellow flags. Charles Stewart over the pit lane. Yeah, thank you, Darrell. Well, the information about Scott Goodyear's car is that this is his 1991 car. Yesterday, during the practice, he actually broke the other car right around the last few laps. It is unable to be repaired, and so this is his old car. It has done no work at all, and so he's got into it this morning absolutely cold. And that's probably one of the reasons why it's broken down. They haven't been able to set it up properly. Got you, Chuck. Thank you. Boys in the pits doing a great job keeping us up to date with all of the information that's happening over there. It's a busy place, particularly now that the double yellows are out. We'll see who dives in or out of the pits, uses any advantage there. But Michael Andretti still slowing everybody down. And there is uh, the car we're talking about, car 15. John Andretti's been using these yellow flags very well indeed. He had that unscheduled pit stop for that puncture. I see now that he's up to uh, eighth position or ninth position, and he's every time there's a yellow out, that gives him that little bit of better opportunity to go past those back marks. Well, you can see the tow rope there that Jackie uh, was fairly critical of earlier in this race, being hooked up to the car now. What sort of control? I mean, behind those vehicles, I've been towed behind vehicles before. You, you know, it's 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 not easy, and on those big tyres, that that's pace i mean is that dangerous in itself no there's no great danger the driver has it hooped over the roll bar there you can see the rollover bar there the driver's got it clenched together there and it can be pulled in they just wrap it around there the driver holds it and he drives the car on the brake as ever whatever he wants it's not a dangerous situation he's very low in the car of course he's got to keep an eye open and keep the the rope as tight as can be but uh, the danger from my point of view is that the business of the uh, uh, the slow go going of the truck in front of enormously fast cars going at fairly high speed. That's what I really meant. I didn't mean there was any uh, danger for the driver here. It's just that uh, I just thought if anything did happen, I mean, he's sitting in the car with a tow rope with fast cars or anything. I don't well, think that's the, safe. The, the, the pace car is going very slowly now. So once that's happening, it's OK. It's only when you see a service vehicle out there, that's where the danger lies for me, because the service vehicle is only probably doing 100 k's. So, well, they would have tried to bump start Goodyear's car, except he was facing the wrong way. No, he's turned it round and they bump started it. Well, they've and, got and it going. He's on. Yeah, they've got it going. So there we go. Well, that's a bit of a break for him. Scott Goodyear have turned the car around and bump started him again, so he's back on the uh, on the paddock. So there's still under double yellow flags in front of us here, trying to sort all this out. There's a lot happening at once here at the moment. But uh, let's explain further this yellow flag situation because it is fairly new to Australian racing. The man who has to make the decision on the full course yellow is declared is the race director and chief steward, Wally Dallenbeck. He explains to Charles Stewart how he decides on a race resumption. As soon as the uh, safety crews have the, uh, uh, the particular area where the scene is back in a uh, raceable condition, uh, they tell me and they return a station. As soon as they return a station and I have a clear racetrack, I indicate 
uh, to the starter. Starter, give them the one finger, and the one finger indicates the next time by we'll be racing. And what about the pace car? What instructions does the pace car have to operate under at that point? We have uh, complete command and control of the pace car uh, by another channel, and we tell the pace car when to turn off the light. We tell them when to speed up and bring the car into the pits. And at the same time, all the teams here know when we're going to go green. So everyone, including the guys in the race car, know through uh, radio contact when we're going to go green. Now, as Wally Dallin back a name that goes back away in Indy car racing too and those big front engine often houses. Oh, and rear engine cars too. I raced against Wally Dallin back. Um, yeah, he, he was a racer of the 60s and uh, it wasn't so many years ago that Wally came out of racing. I think he was still racing in the early 70s, so he's been around. Wally Dollenbeck was the uh, the guy that gave me my rookie test when I went over to take Mario Andretti's place when I raced at Elkhart Lake, and he's the person that uh, controls a lot of the rookie tests. Yes, he's much involved in the safety, and he's done a very good job uh, on that. There's one other criticism I would just like to offer here. Scott Goodyear has got back in this race by being given outside assistance. Now, in a lot of the formulas of motorsport around the world, that would be considered an unfair advantage. If you've got stuck out on the track and it's been a problem either by driver error or mechanical failure, why should you be given the opportunity of taking advantage over other people who may not have that same privilege because of certain other circumstances? I, I just wonder why the pace car should go out and all of that advantage be given to that driver. Well, well that's the point. Not only the fact is he being given the opportunity to restart the car, but they've added extra danger by putting that truck out again. There's the top standings for you, Andretti, Alonso Jr., Fittipaldi, Sullivan, and Mario Andretti. And uh, Jackie, I'll remind you that Alan Jones is talking about his rookie driver's test there. Remains the only man ever to reach the podium in his first and only Indy car race. And that was back in 84 when Jones, of course, uh, replaced Mario. He's just talking about it at Elkhart Lake. Well, that's a pretty impressive thing, Mr. Jones. I went to Indianapolis as a rookie and damn near won my first Indianapolis in my rookie year. With, with eight laps to go, I was leading by two laps at Indianapolis and an engine whose name I forget the name of, but it began with F and it was four letters, uh, actually didn't see me through the race, but I was in fact leading the race by two laps. It was a, a terrible shock to the Scottish economy. <laughs> it's a few stories being swapped here in the commentary box. The pace car light is out, we'll go on this lap. So once that light goes out, Bear's looking back and look at the storm moving in. On the Gold Coast now, those black clouds, we know there's been rain in the Sydney, Newcastle area moving up the uh, north coast, and there it is, that's the front of it coming through. Let's hope it holds back because the weather here has been sensational since last Tuesday, and we'd hate to see the rain uh, come tumbling down now and spoil things, but it's not in our hands and it is moving in. The field really bunched up now, they will be racing this lap because the lights are out on the pace car. There's the man with the flag. He's waiting to wave that. It's very windy out there also. We can see the flags waving around top of the stand. Alonso could make a move for the pass here in the chicane. Look for this. Come in now. No, he's not going to do it. He was having a real good look there. That could have been a situation of uh, some concern to um, young Mr. Andretti. So Michael Andretti still out in front, but Al Unza Jr. right in behind him now, as Jackie said put his nose out and had a look and decided to pull it back in again. And of course, Emerson Fittipaldi still sitting back there in third spot, but already he has dropped back behind these two, although that shot was a bit deceiving. He looks a little closer there as they come down to the left-hander. You know, Daryl, talking from a spectator's point of view and not the driver's point of view, um, I quite frankly wouldn't mind seeing a little bit of rain, to be honest with you, because I reckon it'd be really interesting. It would be very exciting, to say the very least. Keep in mind that this is a a racetrack that's used by normal cars in a normal year, and Alancer is definitely closing up there. Emerson Fittipaldi is not getting away from Eddie Cheever either, so that's quite interesting. Another interesting move in there is now Danny Sullivan. Uh, yes, and incidentally, the hat man has lost his hat. Danny Sullivan has moved up in front of Mario Andretti, and also Bobby Rahal, John Andretti, the last of those through, but it's Michael Andretti out in front from Al Unza Jr. already, he has stretched a couple of car lengths. So Michael Andretti controlling things from the front. Here's Eddie Cheever. He's made a move. Remember, he, have, he has those clutch problems that were annoying him when he made the stop. But out on the racetrack, as Jackie's explained, it's not really worrying him too much. A lot of the drivers aren't even using clutches out there. 
working on the rev range, but here's Michael Andretti. His Alan's a junior coming down behind him. Emerson Fittipaldi does drop off, Jackie, every time there's a restart. Yeah, there's something wrong there. He's dropping back too far, and, and Eddie Cheever is definitely getting him under pressure with uh, 36 laps gone. So I think we're, uh, we're going to see uh, there's something strange about Emerson's situation there. But uh, there's no doubt in my mind that Alan Jr. has to drive harder to keep up with uh, Michael Andretti than he would like to be, and that affects his tire temperatures as well. Andretti has led all 35 laps completed so far, therefore will receive one bonus point in the championship uh, tally for the year, so it's very important. Look at that shot there as you look at the waves rolling in, and look at that cloud. It's getting darker and darker. I predict some rain here because that would be over the Gatta area, which, of course, is the southern end of the Gold Coast. It's very black there and looked like rain falling. But Andretti still uh, in front. There's uh, Emerson Fittipaldi, Eddie Cheever, Danny Sullivan, Mario Andretti, and also Bobby Rahal, and there's Beers, and, of course, John Andretti. So as they all fly through there, they're bunched a lot closer, and it seems to me that Emerson Fittipaldi may be holding up Eddie Cheever just a little. Charles Stewart in the pits. Thank you, Darrell. I've just been talking to Emerson's pit. They say the car has no mechanical problems, but guess what? He's got the hat. The hat that was on the other cars is now on his car, so maybe that's concerning him a little. Of course, we've just been told up here, too, that Eddie Cheever is a lap down, so we apologise for confusing, but with starting and stopping, we're sorting ourselves out here. The hats are a problem. Now Emerson has the hat. Well, there'll be hat man of the year. There, there was always an award in London for the hat man of the year. That's very right, and it's in the right wing again, and there you see it's the left wing, oh, it's the right wing, left of our camera position here, and it's right over the end plate, but I don't think it'll be doing a lot of damage right there. So there's the famous hat, it's been everywhere, there was two of them at one stage, and that's obviously, uh, we think, come off the Unza car, but uh, anyway, Emerson Fittipaldi doing the best he can. And it uh, certainly would be a different style of hat worn up here next year if the organisers have anything to do with it. But Eddie Cheever, of course, in that sandwich, but one lap down. So, although we thought that he may have been getting held up by Emerson Fittipaldi, he's still a lap down on the field. And Emerson Fittipaldi now has stretched his legs and made that gap a little more wide open. Danny Sullivan is, sits in behind him. Then Mario Andretti and Bobby Rahal. That's the order. But out front, of course, it's Michael Andretti. Alonso Jr. still battling it out first and second. You're riding now with Eddie Cheever, and you can see watching work the walls out through the chicane area. Wonderful to watch these fellows work. Such a tight circuit. It's quite narrow in places as you look down on some of the twisty parts of the circuit. They have to negotiate through these wonderful high-rise buildings where most people in Australia enjoy their holidays. It's certainly uh, a traffic situation of a different problem they face when they come here in holidays. But at the moment, the streets of the Gold Coast are live with Indy cars, and it's quite a sight. Danny Sullivan's... Uh slowly sort of creeping up. We've just heard that it's pouring in Coolangatta. We've got a south south easterly, or it's actually swung virtually around to a uh, southerly. So and there's the front. Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see that weather here in about five or ten minutes. Well, that's right. Coolangatta, of course, not that far when you're taking a straight line down the coast, and we predicted it was raining down there. The clouds very, very dark indeed. Wide with Eddie Cheever down here. It's quite sensational stuff when you see how close they get to the walls. Through the chicane, little flick there, comes back, almost brushes the wall there, and you'll see now get really hard on the brakes coming down there. So as you're riding with Eddie Cheever, we'll take a break and rejoin the Gold Coast Daikyo IndyCar Grand Prix shortly. Unza Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi, Sullivan you're looking at there, Danny Sullivan, Mario Andretti and Bobby Rahal. Now Danny Sullivan's a very interesting driver because he really has the glamour profile of all of the IndyCar drivers back in the States. He has a home in Aspen, Colorado, he's always playing in the snow, he finished fourth in last year's Gold Coast Indy Grand Prix, driving a car that he won wasn't happy with, with Alfa Romeo power, 11th in the season's point score. He won the Indy 500 in 1985, but he certainly has had not too much luck in the last couple of years or so. He's now racing his 10th year of Indy car racing, and he's uh, put together 19 pole positions and has had 15 victories, including, as I said, the Indy 500. 
and uh, of course seven million dollars in prize money as uh, well but Danny Sullivan now in fourth spot let's have an update on the rain situation we're watching the clouds roll in here Alan Jones what happens if we get heavy rain it's left up to the discretion of the driver and or the team manager to bring them in to put them onto wet tyres Wally Dollenbach can overrule that. If he deems the track to be unsafe by virtue of the fact that the cars are aquaplaning or just spinning all over the place, he then can say, all right, stop the race. Depending on how many laps they've done, they say, all right, that is the, the race completed, that's the event completed. If they're obviously at the very start of the event or less than halfway through it, they can restart it under wet conditions. But Wally Dollenbach really has, the, I guess, the last say, but if we do have spits of rain or we have a downpour in the next couple of minutes, it's up to the drivers to come in and put the wet tyres on. So there you have it. That's the update as you look at Bobby Rahal come through chasing Mario Andretti. And Mario Andretti has just been calmly going along lap after lap. But there he is, Bobby Rahal, the man that now is a co-owner. He's in fifth. That's fifth and sixth you're looking at. He's in sixth spot. And there's the dark clouds. Look at that. You can see the skies are really now coming down very, very heavy. As we said, the rain has been tumbling down on the other end of the Gold Coast, which is, of course, cool and gather. So now, Bobby Rahal closes right up on Mario Andretti. That's fifth and sixth you're looking at. If Bobby Rahal has a good slipstream on Mario Andretti, you could say he's getting a Miller draft. <laughs> My God, that looks, that sounds like one of Murray Walker's. So Bobby Rahal, of course, as we said, the Miller sponsorship, it's a brand new uh, team for him. He's the co-owner with Hogan. Uh, he's put together a lot of uh, money to get a competitive car going. He said he's going to run it like all his other businesses. He has uh, car dealerships back in America, other interests, and he said to him it's just another business. He wants to get on with the driving. And I know, Jackie, you're pretty impressed with the way he's put it together. He's talked to you about it. And as you said yesterday during qualifying, what he's doing is looking after his future. He's looking towards his own retirement, and I think that's very mature of him, and it's very important for sportsmen to be able to find something after they retire from their sport, because after all, it's a very exciting, glamorous life and a very spoiling life. And when you do retire, you've got to have something that will give you as much interest, excitement and satisfaction out of doing a job of work, for example, as you got from the sport. And I'm afraid a great many sportsmen lack that alternative when the day comes when they've got to hang up their helmet or their, their whatever other sports equipment that they're using. So I think Bobby Rahal has been very mature about it. The man we're talking about finished second in last year's race and of course second in the point score last year to michael andretti he lives in ohio and is in his 11th year of indy car racing he has set 15 poles for 20 victories and has earned over eight million dollars in prize money he's definitely closing on mario andretti it seems to me that mario has never really got on the pace this weekend alan it just he a little bit of lackluster maybe and it's Mar it, and, and it's andretti michael andretti's coming into the pit Michael Andretti has got a problem with his uh, left rear tyre. He's, He's coming in fairly tire. slow. Very there's engine. a fire, fire in that car. Engine is off. He came in very slow. Yeah, he had oh, the listen to it. Up. Listen. En engine's oh. gone. Yeah, I think it's had a hemorrhage. Well, there so we go. You can see the smoke and steam pouring out of the car as Michael sits in the car. He's got to be calm. He's taking in some fluid. He would be bitterly disappointed. He's controlled this race from the first green flag. The engine cover off, Jackie, that's not healthy. No, it could be electronic. Uh, he certainly lost some cylinders, there's no doubt. It wasn't a question of just a hesitation. There were cylinders being lost. It may be that one bank of the V8's gone, and it could be electronic. But there's a new battle going on. And, you know, the man that Alan Jones picked here, Emerson Fittipaldi, is certainly within striking distance of Al Unser Jr. But the man who's in pole position for this race and was in pole position is now leading it. So Al Unser Jr. now inherits the lead from Michael Andretti. He's hounded him and hounded him lap after lap and now runs the front position. Emerson Fittipaldi sitting in behind him in second place. Well, Emerson Fittipaldi is close right up on Al Unser Jr. We're looking at a brand new Galmar car and of course the new Ford engine. We're not sure if it was an engine problem, but if it was, Ford would be very disappointing on their first showing of that engine. There we go. Broken head. A broken header, we're told, is the problem. He 
stepped out of the car, Mike Landretti. Well, Ford would be pretty disappointed because the car showed it had the, the top line of speed, Jackie. It was certainly the quickest thing down the straight. Well, any new car with a new engine, there's so many accessories that you've got to make sure work with it. So it's not always the pistons and the conrods and the crankshafts and the valves that cause the trouble. It's sometimes the auxiliary equipment, and that's the case in this particular event. So Emerson Fittipaldi now, the major player we're looking at. We know what Al Hunter Jr. can do. He's controlled the race from second place in front of uh, Emerson Fittipaldi. Still has the beach hat sitting on the front of the car, but Emerson Fittipaldi has definitely closed the gap. And there's the top standings for you. Alonzo Jr., Fittipaldi, Sullivan now in third place. A good drive from him so far. Mario Andretti and Bobby Rahal. Well, we have now Chevrolets first and second, but we have the older Chevrolet in front of the newer Chevrolet, the new Mark II, which is lower and lighter and, uh, and thinner. So uh, this is going to be a very interesting situation. Certainly the Galmar car that Alonzo Jr. has put... Uh put money into and we've just been told there is uh, rain spots on the southern end of the circuit so the drivers will come off some dry circuit onto a damper circuit because the surface there has been wet with some rain we're not sure how heavy it is the wind's still blowing pretty hard here so the rain may not yet have taken effect but it's certainly raining on the southern end of the circuit at the moment Barry Sheen is in the pitch, we'll be going to him shortly. Emerson Fittipaldi chasing Al Unzer Jr. And look for the wet part of the circuit as they come down through the chicane now. And Barry Sheen in the pits. Yeah, sorry about that. Michael, how disappointing. Very disappointing. You know, the car was running perfect. Uh, as the race went on, my car was getting better and better. It seemed to be adapting to the track conditions that were getting better. And uh, uh, then uh, the header broke, the exhaust pipe. It had nothing to do with the engine, just the exhaust pipe. Uh, because as it looked, you know, just watching it on the box, it looks as if you were just keeping your distance and you could pull out a bit when you wanted and just sort of enjoying yourself. Well, that's what we were doing. And then in the end there, I was pulling about a second a lap. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe now there's not going to be as many yellows, so I, I try to open up the lead a bit and... Uh, and anything broke. Oh, we're really sorry for you, and uh, what can we say? Nothing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, back to you, Darren. So Emerson Fittipaldi now has dropped back a little, and Barry has just indicated that he thinks Emerson Fittipaldi may come into the pits. So that's going to be an interesting one to look at too. But at the moment, Alonzo Jr. is certainly getting a bit of advantage at the moment as you're looking at Eddie Cheever there. But Eddie Cheever was a lap down. I'm not quite sure whether he's fought that back on stay. That's still the uh, situation, a lap down for Eddie Cheever as he sits in behind uh, the Penske car. Well, the wind has really picked up in the last oh, minute or so. I'd say it's picked up by a good uh, five knots, and uh, it's quite noticeable. Hello, it's going very slow. He's into the pits. Into the pits, into the pits. Right, Barry, Perhaps they there. removed well that done, hat while he's there. So frantic now, you can see tyres getting banged onto the cars. Uh, you know, with the rain as close as it is, it, the hat's been removed, incidentally. That's the major story of this race this weekend. But it may be that they've got to come right back in again if there's a bit of rain. So another tyre change could be on the books before too long if this rain comes. So Alonzo Jr. would be aware of what's going on. He has radio talk back to his pits. He'd be looking to see just where that weather is he, he knows it's dark up the top he, he would even be aware that the, the wind is coming in from the south up to 40 kilometers an hour our word from the weather bureau so i mean we can see the flags blowing in front of us to stand here and we know how dark the clouds are they've been rolling in for the last 20 minutes so there's a lot to come into play yet emerson Fittipaldi, some word from him from charles stewart yes thank you very much darrell well, uh, Emerson's just come in for a regulation pit stop. It took about 17 seconds. They changed the tyres, and, of course, they removed the offending hat. So if anyone wants a hat, we've got one slightly second-hand down here in the pits. And there's well. the hat. It is a bit... Well, actually, you've been looking for a hat for some time, Charles. I reckon you could get a bit of use out of that. Yeah, okay. Dale, you know all about it. Bit of pal, he's rejoined in seventh place, by the way. I, d I don't understand the part about it being a regulation pit stop. I, I, I don't understand that. But unless he was losing an enormous amount of time, I would have been very tempted to have stayed out there, given that we could have rain any minute. I think that's what I was saying uh, there in that observation previously because it could well be that he's going to have to come back in if there is enough rain because clearly 
uh, Alan Sir Junior now he's got that choice and of course he's much more versatile because he's got a good lead in hand. You can see the papers blowing across the circuit there, fellas, because it was blowing really in a swirling action, so the wind is blowing pretty hard downstairs too. And of course, what has happened now that Danny Sullivan has got himself into second place and Mario Andretti is now on a podium finish if something peculiar happens to the weather right now. So the whole race has changed enormously. 46 out of 65, and isn't it amazing how someone like Danny Sullivan had his problems in practice, in fact smacked the wall very hard in practice, and uh, all of a sudden he's figuring in a position here. He would have, wouldn't have given himself a ghost of a chance three days ago. And he's not, in fact, too far behind. There's Bobby Rahal and Mario Andretti. Now, that's, that's, that's much closer than it was before. That's third and fourth. That's a very close race. Now, this is another story in the race. And, of course, if this rain comes, it's going to change everything again. So Mario Andretti running in third place. This man, Bobby Rahal, chasing him. You're riding with him as he goes up the beachfront. And you'll see the sky darken as they head back down the other way of the circuit. Of course, heading down south where that cloud is coming from. But Mario Andretti now keeping Bobby Rahal at bay. They've had a great dice the last 10, maybe 15 laps or so. And Rahal has been a bit of a sleeper here all weekend. But he's a very crafty race over and there's none more crafty than the man in front of him mario andretti of course finished back in 17th last year after that shut up into the chicane that was a three-car pile-up with eddie cheever and uh, al unser jr as a matter of fact that he was so disappointed and so were the fans right around australia they gave him a tremendous welcome the first time he came here for uh, a race in any car he seems to have pulled out a bit of a distance right now on Bobby Rahal. I mean, suddenly he's disappeared from the picture. I mean, Rahal's either dropped right back or Mario's had a rocket ship uh, acceleration. Well, that was incredible. It's almost like if somebody's tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, you've fallen asleep because he's pulled out something like four seconds in a lap. I think something, I think Bobby must have made a mistake. Well, looking there at Bobby Rahal, we'll try and get a gap between he and Mario. That'll be Rick Mears in behind. Uh, yeah, and I think Rick Mears, in fact, is catching up. I think Rahal's got a problem, and I think that's what's happened. Mario's gone on at his preset pace, and I think Mears is now catching up on Bobby Rahal. He's in trouble. No doubt about it. Rick Mears closing quickly, and Bobby Rahal with an obvious problem. Mario Andretti they were so close, Mario's just gone there. Watch Mears, and there's John Andretti coming in behind Mears now. So it's... So Bobby Rahal has indicated through his radio that he's going to pit. He's pulled over and uh, let Mears through. He's going to pit on this lap at the end of this lap for him on the start-finish line. Now, John Andretti gets through also. He blasts past him, so that's a shame for Bobby Rahal. He's got a problem. Oh, and a sideways slide there for Mears as he comes around. The car's getting pretty loose. And we're having a replay here. That's Mears. We're looking at Mears flashing past. Bobby Rahal. That's the view that Mears had as he flashed past. Unzer is pitting. Unzer is pitting. He's in the pits. And so also is Mario Andretti in the pits too, I think. So no, Al no, it's not him. Al Unzer Jr. in the pits. You can see the fuel get going in. The wheels have been changed. Still no sign of that rain, but that cloud almost over the top of the broadcast box now. That'll come into view very shortly and come into play in this race if it is still raining. Spitting on the southern end. Which incidentally puts Danny Sullivan into the lead of this motor race. Bobby Rahal throws his bottle away. Alanza Jr. puts the throttle down, comes out of the pits. Danny Sullivan now in car 18. The man you're looking at there is now leading this race. And believe you me, on Friday afternoon, he had more problems than he wanted to know about. Now he finds he's in front. The chase will be on now from Alanza Jr. and Emerson Fittipaldi as they try to make the difference. Anza's back in sixth position now behind this man. Barry Sheen in the pits. Yeah, Darrell, I'm standing down here and the temperature has just suddenly dropped about five degrees and it's starting to sort of spit with rain. And looking down towards Coolangatta, I reckon another couple of minutes and it's going to really let us have it. Yes, Barry, that rain's been closing in for the last five or ten minutes. It's a pretty big front. How heavy is the... Are, are they big drops or just uh, a drizzly drop? I can't give an exact measurement, Dazzle, but it's definitely sort of scattering. And looking at the... I can see a high-rise just in the back here and you can see it's raining there, so any moment now, we're going to get it, Dazzle. OK, so Sullivan now into the pits. are oh, getting set for a stop, so now he goes... 
goes from first place into the pits. Interesting to see what's going to happen here. This is a race of changing fortunes. Cars are diving in, cars are diving out. Changes are, play, are changing uh, lap by lap. Sullivan's crew, great job here. Great job as he goes out. Mario now leads. Mario Andretti is now in front. There's the man in front. What a moment for Mario and the fans in Australia. They adore this man. And he's out in front. Can he hang on, Jackie? Well, uh, under rain conditions, you could see Mario Andretti winning this motor race because he's had an enormous amount of wet weather experience. He, he did all his Formula One uh, driving uh, in many, many wet races and won quite a few of them. And Danny Sullivan has now got himself into fourth position. So we have Mario Andretti, Rick Mears, and then we've got John Andretti in third position. And Mario Andretti's pit are setting up for a stop. So Mario will be going into the pits. They're setting up for a stop. So I he... wonder, I wonder if anyone would have the welly because of those rain clouds to just wait a little bit longer, do their pit stop and put wets on. Well, Je what I was thinking, it's also a little bit of a lottery because if the rain came all of a sudden, it would really depend who hadn't gone into the pits or who had just come out of the pits. And the guy who's running sort of fourth could bump himself up into the lead and win the race. Well, I wouldn't leave your television sets at home because I think you're going to see the climax of this motor race under potentially wet conditions, and you could see one of the most ex exciting finishes that we've ever seen. So Barry Sheen in the pitch with an update. Yeah, I was just going to say, I was thinking exactly what Jackie was thinking because the way the weather is, you'd have to come in and you'd have to think, I'll take a punt on it, you know, because it's almost 100% it's going to rain. Mario into the pits now, and you know it doesn't. For sure, they're not going to not going to go for the wets, but uh, you'd have to be very tempted. Takes in some fluid there. You can see Mario and Dreddy, plenty of experience, just sitting there, letting the men do the work. And it was only a fuel stop. It was not a tire stop. Rick Mears is now in front as Mario Andretti blasts his way down. There's the man in front now. He's the man that had all of the trouble with the wing Oil early on. Out. Still got that problem, but he's now in front of... Oh, oh he's out. gone off! That's yeah. a wet track. Look at the tyres. No. That's wet track. Well, whether it was wet or oil, they had an oil flag out as Alan Jones just shouted at there. He saw the oil flag, and in fact, that's the race leader got himself a major problem. To me, that's a wet track. You can that see is. Now. It's yes. wet, really wet. No, yeah. no, Here's for it, games, fellas. This is what's going to sort them all out. Now, Mario Andretti had just come into the pits. Had he fitted wet weather tyres there, he would have been out circulating. Look at the spray getting up already. Now, this is going to be interesting. What's going to happen now? You're going to see cars spinning off here. Well, I've got to say this to you, Pete, you two fellas here. You're the most experienced men in Australia in this situation. You've been calling in that someone should have called their drivers in and made the gamble. Mario Andretti came in as that rain was falling. Somebody must have uh, has made a bad play here. They yeah, the, read it. the problem is, though, Des, like on dry, on wet tyres, you are literally going to be lapping five or six seconds a lap slower than, than slicks. And it, that is a big, big gamble. But... If it, was, if it was spitting, sure, yeah, OK, I, you might have taken it, I don't know. The difference between wet and dry around here could probably be the best part of 20 seconds a lap. But, of course, the pit straight is completely dry down here. There's no sign of it. Now, if they had had one or two people out at different parts of the circuit for the two-way radio, then they would be on top of it. But to be frank with you, uh, the way this race started, there was no chance of that. But here is John Andretti coming into the pits right now. We've got torrential rain along the road, I'm sure of that. Torrential rain at the south, dry at the northern end of the circuit. So that makes it very difficult for the drivers. You can see how wet the tyres are. There it is. Oh, oh, Look at the other end of the circuit. That's but, Tony Benning. How's the car off? But listen, I'll stop the but race. wait till you hear this. That, that John Andretti stopped right now and went back out in slicks. He did not put groove tyres on. Mears He's is going, going on wet. Groove tyres. Mears has wet weather tyres. Oh! Vassa goes off and hits the wall. The only problem is, by the time Mears gets out to take advantage of his tyres, they'll probably stop the race. Yep. He's down yeah, the double yellow area. coming out, I think. 
There's a yellow out, and this it looks Babaza. like they're going to have a full course. John Andretti, you can see how heavy this rain is now. And I've got to say this, we could see this coming. We've shown you the pictures of it coming for the last 20 minutes or so. It was obvious it was oh. going to rain, and look at this. Oh. As uh, we look now at Eddie Cheever. Now, he's done a lot, but he's on slicks. Now, on slicks, it's very difficult. He's look at the speed of that car That's with Mears. He's, he's on wets, and boy, can he cream them now. A minimum of 20 seconds, probably more than that. And that could easily be a collision there. That's Mario involved in that. There's Rick Mears. Look at him accelerate along there. He's going to pass them just like a doddle. The biggest problem is visibility, but the biggest problem for Alan's a junior now, and he's just behind him, is the fact that on slicks, there he's looking. It's slip sliding away, it's called. So now Rick Mears... Oh! oh little spin out. The PIG car going around there. Of course, the other thing is, Rick Mears should not be passing. We've got double yellow flags out, so... I mean, he of all people should know that he shouldn't be passing those cars. Maybe he didn't see the yellow, double yellows with the visibility that's involved with the spray of the other cars. It's a real problem. God, good years and look now, at the Al. and now in the pit straight, torrential rain. So the rain has finally caught up with us here as we settle everything down for a second because it's uh, all happening around the circuit. The heavy rain is falling here now. But we have to remind ourselves that right now as we look at our uh, monitor here, Danny Sullivan is leading this race with Rick Mears in second place and John Andretti is... Is it John Andretti in... No, it's Mario Andretti in third place with John fourth and Andretti fifth. So this, we now we're waiting for Wally Dolan back, basically, to make a decision, I guess. Well, I, I think if they stop the race now and declare it over, it'll be a real non-event. It'll be a bit of a shame. I would like to see them get onto wets and then finish off the race. So we're talking about a possible red flag situation in race control. We've just been informed with that. You can see the double yellows coming out, the rain buckling down. It really is a shame because the weather here since last Tuesday has been superb. We've had nothing but 27 degree days and beautiful blue skies. Eddie Cheever looks like he's on slicks. So we'll take a break. No. We'll take a break as we uh, see the rain tumbling down here. Back shortly, stay with us for what could be a very sensational climax to this the Daikyo IndyCar Grand Prix from the Gold Coast. And Mario Andretti, Emerson Fittipaldi, and you can see the car splashing around here in the rain. It's torrential rain in a moment. Now, we're going to show you a situation that happened just a couple of seconds ago. You physically can't see through that rain. Jackie Stewart, look at this. There's Fittipaldi going off, and that was aquaplaning. I think there's more water on the track now than the track can handle. If I were calling this race right now, I think I would call it off. I think the visibility is very poor. The great advantage of this kart IndyCar racing over Formula One is that they do have a pace car out there travelling at slow speed. But the amount of water on the track, the visibility from the spray that's going on behind the, the, even these cars, there is no visibility. So I think Wally may well put a stop to this race. Or alternatively, they could use the luxury of the pace car and keep them out there for three or four laps because up here we do get torrential downpours that go as quickly as they come. And if they kept them out there and then make a decision, maybe. Well, you know more about your weather up here. I think you're probably right. But at the moment, it's, it's so heavy, Alan, that I think it's asking a lot. And I think the responsibilities and safety is that we wouldn't want to see the wrong kind of accident occurring because it was just too deep. But mind you, at those speeds, exactly. I must say, with the grooved tyres, there's no danger as such. Barry Sheen over in pit lane. Uh, do you read me? Sorry about this, chaps, but uh, it looks like the, uh, the weather is definitely going to clear, and I would say in about... Oh, a couple of minutes, the rain will stop because there's a bright blue sky to the south here and the way the wind's blowing, in actual fact, as I'm talking now, the rain is stopping. So give it a couple of minutes and uh, she'll be all go again. Yeah. So I, I reckon the red flag's definitely out. Well, Barry Allen James was just saying that. He, of course, he's a, a fellow resident like you and he said that the rain here can come through so quickly and clear and with this wind about, it wouldn't take too long to dry the circuit out, even though where we're looking now is this really heavy water. Yeah, well, AJ's right, you know, but as you say, the big problem is, as far as I can see, I've been having a look around at some of the concrete walls, you know, the ballast things on these, uh, the barrier things, and it doesn't appear to be great outlets for the water. So AJ and, and Jackie will tell you that 
the water can't run under the concrete wall, it's just going to pull up and puddle there. Well, we can see that in pit lane, as a matter of fact, Barry, but, you know, Alan called this very clearly. I mean, the rain has now subsided considerably, and with the temperature outside and with the wind, I mean, the track will dry very quickly. The people ready to go when the uh, green flag is thrown again, however, I think it's going to be a very exciting motor race then, Alan, because clearly there's only going to be a groove for a little while, it'll be clear, so it's going to be a very tricky driving exercise. It'll be great. I think we're going to see the leading drivers in America um, driving the fastest cars in America under very difficult Australian conditions. And uh, I think, you know, if they stay behind that pace car for another lap, maybe another two laps, it'll dry it a little bit, the wind will blow it, and then they can get on with the motor race. Well, we're told there's one lap behind the pace car, one more lap behind the pace car. The two yellows are out in front of us here on the broadcast area on the, the main straight. You can see that heavy mist as the water being thrown back from those big tyres. There's the, the double yellows being held out. But visibly, we can see here it's clearing as this storm passes over us. But the water just splashing down. You can see the water coming back. The vision for the drivers in the middle of that pack, horrendous. Danny Saddleman comes past. Mario Andretti comes past. And there's Emerson Fittipaldi. He had a spin, of course, that you saw clearly when the track was very, very wet. But you can see now that the rain is not hitting the lens at the, at the rate it was. So the rain is definitely easing up. The spray, don't be uh, confused with that, against the rain. That's coming off the circuit, being thrown back by the tyres. I tell you what, uh, little Al's looking good. He's, uh, he's what in there? He's in one, two, three, fourth position. He's got Eddie Cheever in front of him. Al is very good in the wet. Um, you know, we, uh, I, I think we've got two more laps to go. Under these conditions, I think when the green goes on, you'll see Little Al come into his own. And little Al actually is in second spot right now, so he's, he's right on. And I think you're right. I think he, in the wet conditions with the youth and exuberance, the bright-eyed, bushy-tailed uh, way he has of driving over a, let's say, more mature Rick Mears may allow him to have that victory. Looking back there at John Andretti in the bright yellow Pennzoil car. And uh, that spray being flicked back, but see, nowhere near as heavy as we saw before. In fact, the rain has eased right down now, and that storm is just a, about past us here. We saw it moving up from Coolangatta some 20 minutes, half an hour ago. It arrived probably about the time we thought, but cleared very quickly. Torrential rain when it hit, but it's passed over and heading to Brisbane now. So the track will dry, Jackie, in a matter of laps once these groove tyres start to have that, that cleansing effect. Well, I don't think these American drivers will have ever had quite a big experience like this before. I think this may be something new to them, and I think the climate change that you have in Queensland here clearly is something that's very special. Uh, I think it's quite remarkable, in fact, that uh, the rain has gone off as quickly as it has, but it will take a long time for the, cla the, the, the racetrack to clear. Well, the weather's definitely clearing. There's no doubt about the rain still falling down in front of us here as I look out the window of the broadcast box. What is going to happen, however, when the green flag is shown, the spray factor here is going to be incredible. The visibility behind for little Al to try and get past Rick Mears is really going to be a big hassle. So Rick Mears leading them around in car four you can see there don't take any notice of bettenhausen or the other car that you can see the red car because uh that has really no bearing on their laps that's eddie cheever he's well down in the bearings the cars we're worrying about are car three which is alonzo jr rick beers in car four they're the two major players here off the start and of course the advantage for rick mears is that he's at the head of the pack and he doesn't have the spray problem the visibility problem which little al is going to have and also rick is very good in the wet because he's a very smooth driver when you're going on these ovals in a America at 230 mile an hour you have to be very very smooth and precise with your movements of the wheel and that has put uh, Rick is also a very good driver in the wet simply because he's a very smooth driver absolutely but I think the little boy is going to be as I said making a charge and of course he knows he doesn't have a lot of time to do it Danny Sullivan sitting there Mario Andretti sitting just in behind him there's Vassa's car, that's the Stars and Stripes car. Dennis Connor's involvement, of course, we know him from the America's Cup. He's big, bad Dennis. Well, he's involved in motor racing and called the car after the yacht, the Stars and Stripes. Jim Vassa, car 47, Alola, out. And, uh, Jackie, I think that uh, first chicane is going to be very interesting when the green comes out. Will it not be? Because they're coming off of a fast straight with enormous plume 
of fog uh, and lack of visibility through spray and they're going to have to get into a very tricky braking area where earlier today we've seen a lot of incidents because of the droppage of oil and keep in mind that these are normal roads used by normal vehicles so the same kind of problem as you and I have both experienced in road courses before you get drops of oil there's diesel oil down there there's normal tire everything gets very slippery when it comes to wet if you're driving on a normal road that's to say a public road well Vassar of course can still get back into the race we've seen that happen but at the moment he's connect up behind the uh, towing vehicle we've got double yellows out in front of us and as I said, at the moment, the rain's still coming down. And that's the pace car there, you see, bringing us around with Rick Mears tucked in behind him, then Tony Bettenhausen, Eddie Cheever. But the pace car also plays an important role during a full yellow practice uh, and flag situation. Now, here in surface, the pace car is driven by champion driver Johnny Rutherford. We're in, in contact with pit control and... Uh when the yellow comes out, they'll tell us standby. And then uh, we're all getting this on radio. We get standby and then, okay, pace car, uh, uh, go out now and get in front of whatever car number is, is the leader. So we go out and we try to pick up, they try to coordinate us with the leader so we can come out of the pits, pick up the lead car, and then everybody packs up behind him. Uh, there again, just to control pace of the race or the, or the cars on the track so that the workers uh, and doing at the emergency are having time and a little breathing space to work on whatever they've got to do to clean it up, get it ready for the cars to go fast and race again. Now, what instructions are you getting during this period about uh, how many laps to go and, and when you're actually going to get off the track? Well, uh, yes, we're, we're, we are in effect their eyes you know, controls eyes. They have television cameras and monitor monitors out there. But I have, have raced long enough to, to know situations and can say it's going to be two more laps or they're going to go one more lap or three more laps possibly. So they know about when. Then we start getting geared up and ready for the restart. And once again, it becomes the situation of getting out of the field's way. And it's a little different because they're single file on a caution. So they come out and they're all eager to get the advantage on the restart. You know, they're, they're one behind the other. And if the guy in second can, can get a, a jump on the guy leading and tie him down to the to turn, then he'll have the lead. Well, you, you've got to be very aware of that because when they come off of that turn, they're going to be hooking them and you've got to be over here out of the way. Well, there you go, the man driving that pace car, which incidentally is the brand new Falcon GT that's getting a lot of uh, publicity here in Australia. So that's the new one, you're seeing that. Now, here's a replay of an incident, Alan Jones and Jackie Stewart. Look, look at how Lunzer coming in. Look, he nearly hits that car. Look at Alan's front right-hand wheel. He has to turn really severely to get out of the way. I mean, that, I can't understand that. I mean, the, the car has been there for about two laps because I saw Vassal let the rope go before as he was being towed. Now, you know, it's a bit of a no-no, Jackie, don't you think? Yes, I really don't understand what the hold-up is on that. If he's in a very strategic area of the of the corner. He should have pulled the car out there. He started to pull the driver out. Then somebody jumped out the cab, ran back to get something else. They should have continued to pull the car to a safer area. Well, I can tell you now that out in front of the broadcast area, and it's quite visible to you around Australia on the screen, that the sun is starting to come out here on the Gold Coast. This is a real tropical storm that's hit us. Lots and lots of rain, but at the moment the sun's coming out. You can see the flags are flying and there's plenty of wind, but uh, this won't take too long to dry once they get underway, I would think, because there's still plenty of temperature in the uh, in the track itself, even though it would have cooled down pretty quickly with that rain. There's still a lot of temperature around, been very humid conditions, the wind is still blowing, but the sun's starting to come out. So it's been a real tropical downpour, Jackie certainly has it's not something that i'm used to seeing very often i must say but i i think the big advantage here has been for this series of racing that pace car coming out i think that saved a great deal of trouble because as we many of us will remember the adelaide grand prix last year where there was no pace car out there there was a lot of unnecessary incidents occurring where a pace car in fact under those peculiar circumstances would have saved a lot of aggravation so uh, it's a plus and a minus I noticed that uh, Rick Mears' wing is still broken and he's going to need that more than ever in the wet because the last thing you want is to have understeer in wet conditions. It's a bit of a job to change that though. It's quite a, a 
a business of securing screws round the tip of that wing and I guess that the Penske pit made their calculation that the amount of time that would be required to change the wing would have been le would have been a bigger problem than merely having the, the little less downforce. Barry Sheen, pit lane. Yeah, Darrell, I was just standing there looking at the uh, the board and it says 11 laps to run. With the amount of water there is at the back of the circuit here, I can't see that uh, anybody that's got uh, wets on now, there's no way that it's going to dry out enough for them to come in and change to slicks. And I was looking at Emerson's car and it still looks as if it's got slicks no, on. No, they're all on wets, Barry, but what's the feeling over there in the pits? I mean, uh, what are the mechanics saying? What are the team bosses saying? Unre unrepeatable about the weather but it's just the luck of the draw you know they realized that uh, um, some of them could have as Jackie was saying oh take, you know could take a punt when Mario was sitting in the uh, sitting in the pits having his stop you know he could have just taken a punt because as he went out it started to rain you know and I bet I bet he was thinking oh dear you know it was a gamble and uh, who knows, you know, you can take a gambler and look like a total idiot, can't you, as we've all done in times gone past. Well, we did it too, Barry. We were saying when he was sitting there that he should have done that, but it's easy it, to be it's... wise when you're looking out of a window and you're bone dry. The interesting information now, though, is Danny Sullivan has been asked to go back a spot because he passed under yellows. He's been asked to drop back a spot for the restart, restart because of being under yellows. I think the uh, the visibility, like uh, Jackie and Alan were talking about, is going to be horrendous because don't forget when they rush past and they get the green flag. Do you remember where the NASCAR prang was with all the oil and everything, and it's had the kitty litter or whatever you call it on it, and it's half going to be slippery. So I reckon the first chicane on the first lap, if we can see, is going to be major. Well, that's uh, exactly the position we're talking about. That scramble down to that first chicane on the Gold Coast Highway, straight Barry, just past the uh, stop start. Anyway, you'll keep on the case in the pits. Well done. All right, and, uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> so Mears undertaken, overtaken uh, with the yellows. We're just watching this here. Now, actually, Alan Jones picked this when this happened because he accelerated past cars under yellows. AJ, you made comment of that when it happened. Well, they're, they're double yellows, and uh, you know, quite clearly, you're not meant to do that. But uh, when we finally do get the green, because there is only going to be a nine or ten laps to go, uh, they're not going to have the, the luxury of being able to sit back and sort it all out and, and, and take their time. This is now, this race has developed into a ten lap sprint race. Yes, indeed it is. It's going to be very interesting. But I must say, looking down on the pits, the, uh, the forecast that you made and how quickly it would dry out is absolutely true because uh, there's not a lot of spray coming down the pit straight. Uh, because when they came past here last time there was not a lot of plumage coming up from, from the tyres. I think that however it's going to be slippy, very slippery indeed. So you can see the cars bunching up waiting to uh, get the start. This should be the last one. I'm just watching the starter in front of me but he hasn't put his finger up to indicate one more. He's still got the two flags out. Ten laps to go is the word we have from race control. Ten laps to go. We're just waiting because he will indicate with a pointed finger uh, in the shape of a one, that's uh, one to go, but he's not doing that, so we're still under yellows for at least another lap. So we'll take a break and we'll bring you back to a soggy but drying out surface paradise. Hope you're enjoying it, Australia. Andretti, Emerson Fittipaldi, Bobby Rail. They're the top players for you. You can see the track drying dramatically here as they go around. Now, we've been told in the, an American vernacular there is standing water in the first chicane. They will not let the cars go under green until that water moves away or is pushed away by these cars going round with the wet weather rubber on them. I'm looking at the starter right in front of me, still having a conflict with his colleague who is holding out the yellow flag, and then he will indicate. You can see the two gentlemen are talking. He is in radio control and contact with the pace car who is telling him about the condition of the track. So we expect to see a finger go up shortly to say one more lap, but you can see there in the circuit, it is very, very wet where they came off before virtually dry. So they have the problem of coming off a very wet part of the racetrack onto almost a dry circuit. Well, the interesting part about it, I just asked Jackie before, is that Wally Dollenbeck is the man that has the initial say on whether to go green or stop or whatever, but surely he is then only told by Johnny Rutherford who's driving the pace car. So unless Wally Dollenbeck is in the pace car, Johnny Rutherford has the ultimate say. 
Well, we're looking at the pace car right now. I'm trying to see if that is Wally inside it, but I don't think it is. There's the so-called standing water. It's not very much, actually, and there's nobody out there, obviously. Uh, nobody's brushing it away, which sometimes can happen with the corner workers, but I think the suggestion is that it may be the next time we go by, the suggestion we hear is that there will be only one lap left to go, so I think we're going to get a green uh, in two laps, basically. That's correct. There's the finger going up now. The starter has put his finger up. He's saying, indicating that there is going to be one more lap. We'll watch when he comes past, but he just indicated to us with a finger up that he will uh, definitely give a green in one to go. He has his finger up in the air, letting the marshals know he's taking it back down again. <laughs> and there's people running on telephones underneath on the track. It's all, uh, it's all go here at the moment. Let's hope it's all go because uh, we're waiting to see some racing. But as you can see there, the track's nowhere near as wet around that part of the track as it was earlier up uh, where we saw. That's looking down. You can see how close the sand, the Gulf, famous Gold Coast sand and surf is to this racetrack as they run up past the, uh, the main beachfront, heading up towards Main Beach and Narrow Neck for those people sitting in Victoria, West Australia, South Australia, Darwin, Tasmania. You've been coming here for holidays. We'll put you in the right position. They're heading up to the uh, main beach and narrow neck area now and they, uh, the two chicanes that are there. You can see the corporate boxes and uh, all of the grandstand areas that have been uh, built. Now we're coming to that narrow neck area, as you can see there, up along Main Beach in the summer months and around Christmas time. Absolutely packed the capacity with tourists all over Australia. Certainly looks different now. And the beautiful waterways of the Gold Coast here, where uh, all of the boat owners and people who love to fish, there's so many things to do in this area associated with water, and that's come into play here this afternoon in this race. We've had quite a lot of waterfall in a short period of time. That wasn't the great problem. The big problem is getting rid of the water off the circuit so these cars can once again drive at competitive speeds. But the cars have... Uh have been told to swap positions. That's car three and 18 have been told to swap positions. That's Danny Sullivan and Mario Andretti. No? Al Unser Jr., I'm sorry. Al Unser Jr. And, uh, and Danny Sullivan being told to swap positions because of the uh, yellow situation. Sorry if I'm confusing at home, but it is a bit confusing here. We're getting messages from race control from our own people here, and uh, we're trying to keep on trying to keep on top of the situation, which I think we're doing at the moment. Right, so Ricky Mears leading them around. The car you see second and third. Don't take any notice of that at all. That's the top place for you. Mears, Sullivan, Al Unser Jr., Mario Andretti, Emerson Fittipaldi. That's the top five as they come around. Now the finger, I think, is about to go up. Yes, it has. So the finger has gone up. So we'll have one more of these laps to go and we will be under race conditions. But you can still see how wet it is there. I mean, absolutely wet there as they come down onto the start-finish line where we are sitting. And then, of course, they go into the dry part of the circuit. So we'll have seven racing laps. Next time round, when they're given the green, we'll have a seven-lap race. And uh, where that water is sitting, of course, is right in that bumpy braking area into the chicane that's caused all the trouble. But it's still, by any standards, really not that wet. No, I don't think there's much water there. There's a pool of water. I think the biggest problem, uh, as I think we recognise as drivers, is it's going to be so slippery. And then the visibility factor for the cars behind, because the track will be filled with people, they'll want to draw out of the plume of spray that comes out to try and get a fresh look at what's going on. So the whole track is going to be being used. It's quite interesting from a wet weather point of view of how to drive a track like this when you are trying to get a quick lap in because sometimes an unconventional line can be faster than the groove because the groove's got the rubber and the oil on it. The unconventional line sometimes gives you a lot more bite. So it'll be interesting to see who uses what part of the racetrack. Now, there's not much spray at all from any of the cars as we're looking at our monitor now. Particularly in a constant radius corner, Jack, I think Watkins Glen was a classic example of that where you're going into these great big long sweepers uh, particularly if there's a slight bank on them, it's sometimes a lot better to stay up a lot higher and keep out of the normal racing line. It's far less slippery. So the cars are weaving around, still trying to heat up those uh, rain tyres now, as you can see, trying to get as much heat in as they can. And as we can see, the, the track is a lot drier there. But looking back there from the leading bunch back into the rest of the field, you can see the spray that's thrown up. Of course, as Jack has explained and Alan has explained, 
part of the circuit in that first chicane is probably still the wettest part of the circuit. There, there's more water, so that, that really is going to be a problem for the second, third, fourth cars. Yes, and it's not just the first chicane, it's the second chicane, because the second chicane is faster than the first chicane, and there's a bit of braking to be done going into the second chicane, which has caused this kind of trouble that we saw if you've been watching our telecast for the last two days of Alan Sir Jr., for example. So I think there's, uh, there's a lot of potential for trouble. And then after the second chicane, there's a real heavy braking area before the, the, the complete right-angle turn. So I, I think we're in for a bit of excitement here. I, I hope nobody's left the TV screen, because you're going to see the IndyCar racing probably at its most exciting. Well, there's the dry groove there. You can see the dry groove there. The pace car lights are out. We've got to start. The sun is out. The green flag's about to come out. The power will go on. Of course, the other thing now, too, without complicating anybody, is the dry lines can burn the wet tyres out. So if they really give the car lots of welly in the dry part, they'll burn those wet tyres and won't have the really good traction that they need when they get to the really wet part. All right, we're waiting for the green fade to unfold. You can see there the track's pretty dry. As I said, the sun is out, the wind is blowing, and that'll dry out pretty pretty quickly here, as you can see. Coming into sunlight, the cars now, the green flag ready. Now, this first charge down, they're coming onto the main straight area now. They'll be coming down towards towards us any second. That's the corner that leads on to the main straight area. Now you can see it's wetter. We've got a green flag being waved. So they're racing now. Mears, look at the spray that he generates back. And they come back to the second or third place cars. We can see Sullivan and Bader move through there. Hard to pick anyone up. There's Mears, 59 or 65. Through he goes nicely. Followed and there's by Danny Sullivan. Danny Sullivan's through quickly and, and, and little Al's back there as well. Eddie Cheever's going to play a part in this because he's quite a good wet weather driver. He's up front, but of course he's a lap back. So he'll have to watch that he doesn't upset what's going to happen in the real turnout for the race. But look at Mears. He's really taking a giant advantage here. He read that start very well, didn't he? And Rick Mears on the dry part of the circuit now, Alan. So now what you're talking about, he's got to try and drive you. Danny Sullivan there in second place. What I'm trying to say is he he'd have to dry into the wet parts of the track to keep his tyres wet. Well, maybe not right now, but certainly that would be a factor in four or five laps if they start to burn out. He'll then start to have to look for the wet parts. I think this is going to be interesting. This is the story. The two cars that are just passing out of your picture now, that's Danny Sullivan and Alan Sir Jr. They're not making the amount of ground on Mears that I expected them to do. And I think Danny's being even a little bit cautious there. This is going to be very tricky now. Really, to have a clear track is a big advantage for Rick Mears. Rick Mears in front. The blue and white car you're looking at there is the second car. And then the white nose car with number three, which is Alan Sir Jr. is third. Forget at this moment the red car that you're looking at in each other because he's the left down. Well, the drivers have been very well disciplined. We haven't seen any heroics in the wrong fashion. I think it's going to be way. And here's little Al having a look. Whoops, a daisy. He nearly had a nose cone taken off there, or at least a front wing damage. So he's got to watch himself under braking because when you get very close under wet weather braking, you can lock a tyre up very easily. So Danny Sullivan, the man that had so many troubles and a rather big accident in uh, qualifying, is now sitting in second position that has Alan Jr., the man that took pole for the race, sitting right behind him. He's probably, had, and he's doing the unconventional line business there, he's probably had more experience in driving in the rain than Alan Jr. because of his European road racing experience. So Sullivan, now look at Alan Jr. closing up. Oh, the brakes and makes the pass to Alan Jr. just lunged at him there and took him into the chicane on the brakes. Oh, that was a good move. Very decisive. Now it's going to be interesting because little Al knows he's only got six laps or so to go and he, he you know, he's really going to have to go for it. Mears has got a little bit of a luxury. He can sort of cut, you know, if he goes in a bit deep, he can come off the accelerator and just be a little bit more gentle with the car because he knows he's got that cushion. Little Al can't afford that luxury. He's really just got to drive 11 tenths now. And here's the pass again by Jovi Denham under braking and that's on the wet part of the racetrack that Alan to Junior was, but it was a very convincing late braking exercise. Also, we'll have to keep our eye open for Emerson Fittipaldi who's back in fifth position now and he could easily improve his position. There he is back there. In fact, I think he has pre improved it a little bit already. Certainly has, and he's closing in very quickly on Danny Sullivan. There he is there. There's Sullivan, the red and white car with the five on it. Bobby Rahal also closing in pretty quick, and Mario Andretti coming into play. Well, Mario Andretti, in fact, has been passed by, post by both Fittipaldi and Rahal in that very lap, I think. So Rick Mears out in front at the moment. It's Rear Sullivan, Alonso Jr. 
And they're the mainstays we're looking at now. Here's Mears. And as you said, Rick Mears wouldn't need Eddie Cheever doing this like a hole in the head because really uh, he's a lap behind and he could probably well do without him. You know, he's probably thinking, well, Eddie, look, you know, I can't go much slower than what I'm going. And, you know, in a situation like this, Eddie could make a little bit of a mistake, as Jackie was saying, lock up a brake and just give uh, Rick a touch up the backside. You know, a leading driver does not need this. Is he? I mean, he's trying to unlap himself, obviously, here, but uh, it's just the annoyance you don't need. That's right. He, he's trying to make a name for himself, too, because, you know, he, look at he's making the pass. Whoops, a daisy. Let him go, Rick. Let him go, Rick. Good boy. Because if they had gone in there and had a touch, it wouldn't have been any good. Now, it could be that Eddie will draw away now and make a clearer picture for uh, for Rick Mears. Let's see what happens with four laps to go. Five laps on the road to go. Four, four laps on the screen, but five actually to drive. Question, Jackie. Now, if Rick Mears sits in behind Eddie Cheever and, uh, or at a comfortable distance behind him, here's Emerson Phillip Valley coming in. Now, that's Rick, that's, that's Rick Mears. If he sits in behind Eddie Cheever, is that helping him as far as Cheever drying out the circuit on the really wet parts? No, no, it doesn't at all. In fact, uh, if he gets into any spray, it's a bit of a problem. But look what's happened now. He's used a different bit of track and got a lot more grip coming out of there. So Rick Mears is working the uh, tyres onto the wetter part of the circuit. Eddie Cheever is in front of him. And now here's Al Unzer. Al Unzer Jr. is taking advantage of, this, of the fact that Eddie Cheever has gone past Rick Mears. And now Al Unzer Jr. has been able to close up on Rick Mears. And Fittipaldi is back there too. I saw the other red and white car not too far back. So now getting very interesting. I think Fittipaldi's past Sullivan. So I think Fittipaldi, in fact, could be up into third place. You're correct. He certainly passed Sullivan. So Fittipaldi is on the boil at the moment. So any Cheever, really, is, is dictating what is happening here because Rick Mears, sitting behind him, know that Cheever is a lap in front of him and everybody else is closing and up. And Fittipaldi at really is the man that's going quickly because Fittipaldi's right on the tail now of Alan Sir Jr. Look at that. That's the red and white car, not that one. That's Rick Mears. Now you've got Alan Sir Jr. Then you've got Emerson Fittipaldi. This is warming up for a very last hard lap, three laps, I guess it'll be. No doubt about that, Emerson Fittipaldi, with all his wet and driving experience that Jackie has talked about and Alan Jones has talked about really putting this to uh, well great advantage at the moment he's closed right up on Al Unser Jr as you can see them going through this wet part of the circuit water laying there he's chasing Al Unser Jr in the second league of the Penske cars Mears is out in front in the sister car he's going to pass Al Unser Jr pretty certain that uh, Fittipaldi will make his move and get past Al Unser Jr then of course it could be a Penske one too so here we go, Fittipaldi comes down, gets on the outside, two under brakes, and does it. Takes Al Unser Jr. So Fittipaldi has virtually come out of nowhere and is now running behind his teammate in second place. And Rick Mears would know that he's got him right there. And there's Eddie Cheever being passed by, by Rick Mears. Now that's going to maybe put the cat amongst the pigeons because Emerson's going to have to get past uh, Eddie Cheever now. And of course, in the meantime, it gives Rick Mears a little bit of a cushion. A little buffer that he was looking for. He placed the car there, but Emerson Fittipaldi being chased by Al Unser Jr. There they are, Bobby Rahal, then Danny Sullivan. I wonder if there's going to be team orders come into play here. I was just thinking that, Jackie. I was just thinking if you were Roger Penske sitting in the pits there, you think, I can't afford them to touch and spin. Well, I tell him to hold station. Well, Barry Sheen is checking on that very point at the moment. He's heading for the Penske pit to find out how they'll play this on team orders as we call the action. But Emerson Fittipaldi now has got to get past Cheever to have a go at Beers. Eddie would really be best to move out of this. It's difficult for a race driver to take that kind of advice. But right now, the, the whole climax of this race is in his hands. So Eddie Cheever, the ham in the sandwich here. Yeah, I, I really, you know, as much as Eddie is out there earning his living and uh, he is a lap behind and uh, it would be a shame if he holds up Emerson and lets Rick get away, which he has done there. You can see that they've actually, Rick's pulled out quite a gap and, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a shame, really. So Emerson well, got, Sorry, I beg your pardon, but he got the blue flag there and he's making his move. Emerson Fittipaldi is through. He's into second place. Now let's see what the man does. And I wonder if 
by any chance Barry can talk to the Penske pit and ask what their decision is. He's over there doing that now with three laps to go. It's now Rick Mears leading Emerson Fittipaldi to two Penske cars, and Emerson has closed up pretty quickly. The gap there. So Fittipaldi, the most experienced man on a road course with rain out of the two drivers, no doubt about that. And look at this, he's closed right up on Rick Mears. And we have a real dogfight in the same team on our hands now as they head up the beachfront. He's certainly fast enough to do it, Alan. I think he can do the pass. It's just a question of whether he's now going to be allowed to. This is politics within a team. Well, that's right. As I said before, Rogers now faced with the decision. Let them race. Maybe they'll touch going into a chicane and have each other off. And I certainly don't want that as a team owner. Or do I tell them to uh, uh, stay where they are and, get, and I've got a one-two from a team? And there is, in fact, Roger Penske in the top right-hand corner, one of the most successful businessmen in America today, the biggest Toyota dealer in the world, owner of Detroit Diesel, owner of the Penske Hertz truck rental business. And there Fittipaldi is the pass, and he's locked his brakes, but he's gone through. Well, well, well. And another attempted pass by Rick Mears. That no was... team orders there, Jackie. No, sir. No gentleman after you, sir. Business here. Big slide, too, as he came past Rick Mears. He locked up the brakes, got him under. And as he put the power down again, the car really broke away. He caught it quickly again. So your prediction, Alan Jones, that this could happen on a dry track is certainly coming true with Jackie's prediction that he is the most experienced man under these conditions on a road course. Well, of course, in Grand Prix racing, you've got to run in the wet all of the time, and there was a lot of wet races when Emerson Fittipaldi was doing his number, but look how he streaked away. And, of course, if I were Rick Mears, he's, he's right off the track. Can he... Ah, he's straight on again. <laughs> well, I think that if I were... I was going to say, if I were Rick Mears right now, I would stay back. Now, there's no wing damage that I can see. I don't think he will be penalised for that, by the way. I don't think the stewards will penalise him for taking the shortcut. No, I think that was just an honest driver error and you can't penalise him too badly. That Look, he's come in, he left his brake a little late, hit a little bit of water, whoops, lost a bit of steering. He's let the brakes go to get his steering back, driven over, gotten away with it, clean skin too. Hasn't done any body damage at all. He was a lucky boy. So would that be the wet tyres on the dry track under brakes? No, I don't think so. I think in this particular case, I don't think the tyres have got hot enough yet, but they'll be beginning to worry themselves. They'll be getting a little gooey. It's a little bit like leaving a Mars bars out in the sun. This, this thing gets melted and it's not as strong and as firm as it once was and that's how it comes back to the driver so looking at first and second team cars the penske cars dodging around the traffic just flowing the car around as emerson fittipaldi he's had one off under brakes as jackie said no damage that we can visibly see here and he really has now opened up quite a gap on rick beers once he got onto the dry part of the circuit there he's opened up a gap he's throwing the car around and looks very safe rail now bobby rahal has moved up into third place but the big interest is between the two penske cars but at the moment, Emerson Fittipaldi has it all under his control and is building, if anything. There's the top players for you. Fittipaldi, Myers, Rayall, Alanza Jr. and Danny Sullivan. Well, I don't want to put the Mario Walker mockers on it, but I tell you what, what a fantastic result. Two brand new cars, two brand new engines, first and second in the first race. They're, they're on the last going, lap now. They're on to the last lap, Dal, and I seem to remember one man called Alan Jones choosing Fittipaldi to win the race while practice was going on. Another what can fluke. I say? Emerson Fittipaldi now through that wetter part of the circuit again. You can see the water laying there. This is the final lap. Oh, and Rick Beers gets a bit nervous behind him, the car. You can see it under brakes, moving around. He's still in second place. Would you now sit back and say, well, there's a gap with the last lap. It's got to be second for me. And, and he hope will, that he Emerson makes doing, a mistake. He will be doing that. that. That's what he'll be doing. Now, you won't see Rick Beers making a charge for Emerson Fittipaldi right now. That would be very futile. Emerson there cocked his head to the side. That was him looking at his rear view mirror to see where Rick was. Rick, with the, the wisdom that he has, will be deciding now, let's be sure to get this second place finish. And Bobby Rahal, of course, was on the podium last year and he's now in third place this year. OK, so Emerson Fittipaldi with a wonderful drive here and by gee, he really has played it very coolly right through the weekend. He didn't do any flash in the first practice session. In qualifying, he was steady and led the fastest time to the latter part of that session. Was knocked off for pole in a dramatic dash by Al Unzer Jr. And in this race, has just played it in as he's gone along. He's made his pit stops at the right time. He's handled the wet weather. And now, of course, in a drying track, he's taken the place that he wanted so badly. They all wanted so badly first place. 
I tell you what, I, I don't know what it's bit like being a, a horse owner at a, at a racetrack for the horses, but if you're Roger Penske looking at your two cars coming on like this, I don't think they'd be much more exciting. So, as Emerson Fittipaldi just comes uh, and weaves his way through the last laps of this lap, there's Roger Penske up in the top corner. He'll be looking down his cars one and two in Australia. And, of course, this is the first race the PPG series for the year, the championship series for the year. Look, there goes the hand, there's the chequered flag, and the race winner, Emerson Fittipaldi in the Penske car, second place to his teammate, Rick Mears, and third place goes to Bobby Rahal, and that's a great result for Bobby Rahal, also in a brand new team, which he co-owns. But a fantastic feeling for Emerson Fittipaldi. He's been there on many race racetracks all around the world. He has indeed, and he's won a few of them. His son, his young son of 16 years of age is here, I had breakfast with him the other morning and he proudly told me his son wasn't at all interested in motor racing. So Emerson Fittipaldi taking the applause of the audience as he goes round there. Rick Mears going to draw alongside maybe or not. Actually Emerson and I had a collision on a slowing, da uh, slowing down lap once in Monte Carlo where I ran into him. I didn't notice him as he had come alongside to congratulate me on a victory and I ran right over him. Very unfortunate. Well, it's a wonderful result because uh, brand new cars, and Jackie, you explained these these cars was literally out of the box. They have had little testing. They took them out of the box and have done one and two here. They've done a great, there's a great result actually for the Penske team, bringing them back to success. They had a disappointing season last year and they've certainly come back with great strength in this very first uh, race. And everybody was talking about the fantastic times the Fords were doing and how many miles they've done. And I, I'm not blaming my own trumpet, but I said you went until you see those Mark II Chevrolets. Charles Stewart, pit lane. Thank you very much. I've got Roger Penske with me, obviously a very happy man. Describe your feelings to me at the moment, Roger. Well, it's uh, just great to think we came all this way. We've uh, struggled uh, here the first couple of days with a new car, certainly, uh, and the engine. But, uh, you know, it's amazing how things come together. I said I hope we had all of our problems. Uh, prior to the race and we sure did the two drivers did a great job i think that uh, we had a test in the rain which uh, really kind of paid off because we knew the cars would be good and you could see that emo and rick were superior once the rain uh, started to fall and also at the end there they could pull away from the field so look it's going to be a long season we got a lot of competition i take my hats off to everybody i'm just glad that we won the first race it's been a long time since we won the first race of the season and a one two to do yeah, Ken and our Mel Marlboro should be happy. All our sponsors, Mobile, you just can't uh, can't beat it. Uh, tell me, were there team orders, or were the drivers allowed to drive however they wished at the end, where they were running one and two and they changed positions? We don't have any team orders on our team. Up until the last few laps, they would we'd be very careful. But obviously, Emil made a move on Rick, locked up the wheels and got by. Rick certainly wasn't going to run into him because uh, they're teammates. But you know, they're good drivers. I tell them at the end, listen, they've got to drive them across the finish line the best you can. Anxious moments for you, though, I guess. Well, I just didn't want to have them both in the fence, that's for sure. Well, I guess it'll be a big celebration tonight. Well, we'll be pretty happy, that's for sure. I hope they're back home. I hope they uh, have a chance to realize all the work the guys did in England and also here. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there we go. A very happy Roger Penske, and you can see the big crowd building up down here. We'll be bringing you more of the drivers as they get out of the cars. We have both uh, Charles Stewart and also Barry Sheen down there. There's Emerson Fittipaldi pulling up. A very excited. Him. He loves to win this man, does he? Always shows with a lot of emotion. Absolutely, and you're going to see him get out of this car in a minute and hug a young man with a red hat and a blue shirt because that's his 16-year-old son who looks like a surfer. He's got longer than shoulder length hair, and I reckon one of the first people that he's going to congratulate to he'll be left of camera where we are at the present time if Emerson sees him that's who he's going to go for but in fact he may even hug Barry <laughs> <laughs> not a pretty sight no? where's his son Barry Sheen is with him Hi. at the moment Barry if you can hear me now and uh, you're just waiting for Emerson Hi. to get there ready. you are there's, there's the son, son. Oh. there it goes <laughs> there we go Barry that's <laughs> like old home week but Barry Sheen getting ready. Well done, Jackie. You played that in very well. We're just waiting for Emerson to get his helmet off. It's a bit hard to talk to him. He's very hot. He's had... Uh, uh, actually, the race time was 2 hours, 20 minutes and 33 seconds. So he's uh, gone through all of that trying time. And you can see the world media there is their ESPN. Of course, we take a lot of race uh, broadcasts off that network. And they're over here in Australia. Oh, goes the sponsor's hat. So we'll talk to Barry Sheen, who is there. Yeah, here I am. Emerson, you've, you've... No, 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 not that way. You've certainly made my day. Are you happy? 